Hey, Cider Crusaders, welcome back to our special Stand with Israel. Uh, I want to talk about the history of Israel and that piece of land. I want to make sure we get a firm understanding of that uh, and the peoples there. Uh, but before we get to the history, let's get uh, talk a little bit about the present and the current prime minister and the government of Israel and understand how that works and how that relates to our government and our relationship with Israel. And to do that, we'll talk with Professor Ido Aharoni, uh, NYU professor of international relations. He's at APCO Worldwide, and he's the chair of the Charney Forum for New Diplomacy. Mr. Aharoni, how are you, sir? Very good, very good. Uh, nice to be on your show. Thank you for having me. Good to talk to, yeah, good to talk to you, Ambassador. So let's talk about Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, his last, what has been 12 years as prime minister. Um, what's your assessment of his job performance, and uh, what's the future for him and the, for the politics of Israel? Well, you know, like many things in Israeli politics, it's very, very difficult to assess because he's uh, far from uh, concluding his, his legacy. Um, he is the longest serving uh, prime minister, although uh, when you compare him, of course, to David Ben-Gurion, you have to remember that Ben-Gurion was at the helm for 27 years, with the exception of a couple of years when he retired and came back. So uh, he is the longest serving uh, leader of the state of Israel, not the longest serving leader of the Zionist movement. Um, it's important to note that in Israel, the system is dramatically different than the American system. We do not have a presidential system. People do not elect an individual, but rather a political platform. And it looks like that the, um, uh, the political platform that supports uh, Benjamin Netanyahu failed four times in a row uh, to gain a parliamentary majority, which means that there's a very good chance that Mr. Netanyahu uh, will probably end this phase of his career. He enjoys a great deal of appreciation from Israelis and leaders worldwide, but I think a combination of a too long of a term uh, with certain fatigue uh, brought uh, some of his staunchest allies on the right side of the Israeli spectrum to actually give a hand to his ouster. Hmm. Okay, so, and, and I know this is tricky because uh, how, how would you describe what party or platform is raising an influence uh, from an American's perspective, right? And I know it's kind of weird because the paradigms may be different of left and right and whatever, but who's gaining more power in Israeli politics? Excellent question. Look, in years before, the defining question that uh, uh, that really was critical and was at the core of the Israeli political discourse is where do you stand on the Israeli-Palestinian question? And uh, if you were in front, if you were in favor of the two-state solution, it meant that you're left of center and vice versa. What happened was three very dramatic events. The first is the fact that the Palestinians decline Bill Clinton's compromise in the summer of 2000. Second was the Palestinians rejected practically the Gaza pullout, which was a handover of Gaza to the Palestinians by Ariel Sharon in August of 2005. They used it as a, as a platform to repeated attacks against Israel. And lastly, 2008, Eud Olmert is making a proposal which would have given the Palestinians 100% of all of their territorial demands and they did not even bother to answer his uh, proposal. The, the, the combination of all three events created a new division within Israeli public. Forget the political system. The Israeli public is now looking at the Palestinian conflict as a secondary issue. What is the number one issue that people are concerned with? The chaos, lack of governance, the dysfunctionality of the government. These are the reasons why parties that were natural allies of Benjamin Netanyahu are now joining forces with others uh, to get him out of the government because they feel the government and the country is not being properly managed. It has nothing to do with the Palestinians. I'll tell you more than that. It looks like for the first time in Israel's history, an Arab party is going to be part of the coalition, which means they're going to have access to major budgets. They're going to have a piece of the national pie. And I think it's a good thing for the state. Mm, that's okay. So that is an amazing point. And we just talked about this in our, in our opening segment. 
I think all anyone needs to know, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ambassador, uh, about if you don't know anything about Israel and the Palestinian territories, blah, 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 the fact that no Jews are allowed in the Palestinian territories, but there are Arabs in the Israeli military and Israeli government, like that's all you need to know. So tell me about that. That's wild that there are Arabs not only in the government, but now you say, how do you word that, even in like the majority coalition? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the whole notion of, um, look, one of the biggest problems and challenges that Israel has is the complexity of the situation. People make fun of it. They say, oh, it's not that complex. It's very simple. And they buy into this um, uh, colonialist narrative. The truth is that uh, we have nearly 2 million Israeli Arab citizens. Um, all public opinion surveys indicate that the vast majority of them are actually very happy being part of the Jewish state. Uh, many of them, more than 70% of them, say that they're proud being Israeli. You find them in our national sporting teams. You find them in the Supreme Court. You find them in the parliament. You find them now in the government. You find them in the police. You find them everywhere. Uh, they are part and parcel of Israeli society. It's true. There are tensions, especially in the binational cities. With the Palestinians, is a different story. The Palestinians are divided into two separate territorial units, which unfortunately are being ruled by two different political systems. The West Bank is controlled by the Palestinian Authority, with which Israel has a political dispute. Gaza is controlled by a terrorist organization called Hamas, which is very much like Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Boko Haram, Hezbollah, and, and the likes. It's an organization that does not recognize Israel, unlike the Palestinian Authority, interested in the annihilation of the state of Israel. It's a religious organization that is not interested at all in improving the lives of the Palestinians on the ground. This must be clear. Hamas is not about a better future for the Palestinians. The Palestinian Authority is, and therefore it, he, it is Israel's counterpart, it is Israel's partner uh, for a deal. Uh, so I think that clarifies the issue for our viewers. Yes, very good. Um, which ties into another question. I have a curiosity uh, that I've just learned about. Um, the Palestinian refugees. Uh, and someone was telling me about this the other day, and I, and I said, well, what are they refugees from? And he said, oh, well, 1948. I said, well, that was 73 years ago. Well, and excuse my ignorance, why are there still refugees from, some, from a war from 73 years ago? Yeah, that's a very sad chapter. You know that um, World War II created a global refugee crisis. There were many, many refugees, including my own family, uh, the Jews that came from Arab countries. In my case, my family, my mother's family came from Yemen. My father's family came from what is today Uzbekistan. Um, it created a massive, massive uh, uh, refugee problem. Uh, the only group of refugees that was not settled yet, that their issue was not resolved yet, uh, of the Palestinians. And there are several reasons for it. The first is they became um, a pawn in a much larger game at first, it was the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. Later on, it became the Israeli-Arab conflict, which was represented by an Arab demand to annihilate the state of Israel. The 1967 Khartoum summit, where the Arabs said no to all options of making peace and the Arab economic boycott and so on. And later on, they became part, a victim, if you may, of a smaller conflict, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So there are many forces, some of them mighty forces, that have no interest in resolving the Palestinian refugee crisis. And of course, the same way that they can say that they're children of refugees, I can say I'm a child of refugees, um, but that won't change anything. What we really need to do is be less obsessed with the past and look forward no one really wants, despite of what some uh, commentators in the American and the European media will say, no one in Israel wants to see the Palestinians suffer. However, what are the Israelis expected to do when they're being bombarded by missiles, deadly, lethal missiles coming in from the Gaza Strip? 
And I know this is uh, uh, the, the question of the day in the United States. A lot of people complain about Israeli disproportionate use of force. And the question is, what is disproportionate in war? I've seen combat, unfortunately, in my life. And I can tell you, there is no such thing as disproportionate when you're at war. When someone is trying to kill you, there is no such thing as dispor- disproportionate. You try to do your best to avoid collateral damage, but you have to protect yourself. Ambassador, I wish we had more time, sir. Uh, can we do it again, please? Oh, you don't, absolutely. Uh, Haroni, With pleasure. Yeah. Anytime. Thank you. Ambassador Aharoni uh, from New York University. Thank you, sir. Uh, Let's continue on. Stand with Israel. Get a little more insight.